The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. NDEers often describe intuiting rather than hearing communications when they're on the other side. So if near-death experiencers don't actually hear voices when spirit communicates with them, then do they hear or do they intuit the beautiful music they often hear, they often report hearing? And is it just the mechanism of communication that's different or the nature of the music itself? Welcome to IAN's NDE Radio, brought to you by the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. It's always fascinating to me how a visit to the other side can heighten or change the experiencer's pursuits in this life when they return. Artists will try to paint or photograph the luminescent, while musicians may try to recreate with human instruments the music they heard in heaven. Our guest today is Judith White, who survived death three times during her life. The first time was at age four, the second at age five, and the third time at age 35. Each time she experienced beauty beyond telling. She heard amazing music in the other realm, and after her second other realm experience, she began music lessons hoping to maintain the peace and inner beauty she had felt. Today, Judith is a professional musician who composes performs and teaches primarily on piano. She also plays pipe organs and harpsichords and studied flute performance for many years. Judith has a master's degree and three years toward a Ph.D. in music. In 2013, she presented this program, uh, uh, a program at the International Association of Near-Death Studies Conference in Washington, D.C., and to the Seattle chapter of IANS. Judith, welcome to NDE Radio. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Judith, if you would, please uh, tell our listeners about your three near-death experiences. Well, as a child, I was a normal child with all the ups and downs and struggles with will, with family. And uh, I got to a point at age four where I was starting to have stomach problems and some kind of growth was developing in the intestines. The doctors still never really knew what it was, even after they took it out. But anyway, my father kept saying it was just stomach flu and I would get over it, and that didn't happen. And then eventually my mom just took me to emergency because uh, our pastor's son was in medical school and said that I was going to die any day if I didn't get to a hospital. So she Mm. rushed me to the hospital, and at that point I was definitely insulted because I was put in cribs. I thought that was very insulting. But after I got over that, I, of course, they put me to sleep or I fell asleep. And at some point during that sleep period where there's no time, this beautiful being, a uh, female-oriented being, came and hugged me and said, let's, you know, go to another realm or let's let's go. And I felt totally safe with her. She was very kind and beautiful and gentle. So I left my body with her and uh, we went to through actually kind of a now from an adult's mind I can say through kind of geometrical shapes in outer space type. It's hard to explain. But then eventually we came to the light and uh, in the light the colors were more brilliant and everyone was very kind. Um, There were animals Everything was comforting, warm, loving, uh, a deeper kind of love than what we experience here. And unity, everything was seemed to be in harmony with everything else and unified together. And there was like this background of some type of sound that was like similar to our human voice. Not exactly the same, but it was like a, a graduating uh ascending scale that continued to go up and up and then at a certain point the bases now I'm, I'm speaking from an adult's point of view but for the bases would then drop back down it would be as if they, it continued to ascend up and up and up so that's what the music sounded like the buildings were everything was kind of translucent you could kind of see through everything um 
everything was apparent. Thoughts were apparent. Feelings, um, if you could call them feelings, um, everything was transparent. And it was wonderful. <laughs> I, I don't know how long I was there, I can't say, but I, I do know at a certain point I was told I had to go back. And uh, I said, of course, I didn't want to go back because it was wonderful there. Um, mm. And I really almost argued with them about not having to come back, pleading with them, actually. And they said, no, you had to go back. And it was really important for your mother if you went back. So I ended up coming back to Earth, and um, the operation was successful, and I eventually woke up again um, and was eventually taken home. Now, they did weird things while I was in the hospital. I mean, I know this is really silly stuff, but this is the kind of stuff a child remembers. Waking mm -hmm. up in a crib, of course, I'm four years old, I'm too old to be in a crib, so again, I was very insulted. And then I had to pee in front of everyone. I mean, it was a big ward, so there were all kinds of kids, sick kids in there in cribs. And I had to pee in this, like, big jar. It was embarrassing. Even at that age, sure. a child is very sensitive. <laughs> and um, so I just was very happy when it was time to take me home. Mm -hmm. And um, so I went home, and about five or six months later, when I was supposed to start kindergarten, um, I became very ill again, and my parents knew something was wrong again. So I was taken to the hospital again, and they said, well, I don't know if they took x-rays or what they did, but they determined that gangrene had set in and that I was, again, on my deathbed. Well, my parents demanded that I be taken to the best hospital in the Bay Area, which Kaiser, I was part of Kaiser, because yes. apparently their equipment was not sterile, totally sterile. So uh, there I am in the hospital again, uh, unconscious again, sleeping. This is just what it felt like to me. And then at some point, again, no time. There's never any time in these other realms. It's just here on Earth. Uh, once again, I'm in another realm, only this was a little different. Again, it was very loving and everything was in harmony and the beauty and all of that was the same. With a slightly, the colors were slightly different, I have to say, and um, the focus was frequencies. The focus was how all of life is created um, through frequencies. Everything is frequencies, and I remember them. I, I seem to be with a friend, like on the floor playing games. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but but then we were supposed to, we were being trained at the same time, so we were allowed to play games, and I think the games were also related to frequencies, and yet they seemed to be constantly giving us information. I couldn't tell if the other person I was playing with was from that reality or not. I, I couldn't tell at that dimension. Um, there were no signs that, that there's no way I could have known. I, I didn't see any similarity. We all just seem the same. So when you go into different dimensions you're in the same kind of form those other beings are in. Um, so I couldn't tell a lot about that. All I could tell was that it was comforting and I was safe and everyone was kind. That was important to me. <laughs> <laughs> My family was were a little dysfunctional, so kindness was very important to me. And um, somehow I was being taught that a faster frequency is a higher order of life and that I should strive to learn to create with frequencies and learn to strive for the highest and the best, which is a finer frequency. It was always told to me right from the beginning that I'd be going back, so there was no argument, no debate about that. It was just, you know, this is the way it is, but you're here with us for a while until you go back. They didn't have to eat. There was no food or, you know, going to the bathroom or any of the normal human functions we have here. Um, everything was mental. You know, everything came in through the mind, mental telepathy mm -hmm. or whatever you want to call it. Uh, speech was, you know, obviously it was mental. Um, but you could, there was still some kind of seeing and hearing, just like in the previous experience. Uh, just a different set of senses, I guess. And then I ended up 
that's all I can remember of that realm. And then when I came back to Earth realm, um, I uh, once I became well enough, my family had moved into a new, beautiful new house, and uh, I uh, then suddenly wanted to start to play the organ. That's what we had in the house was an organ, <laughs> and. Um, I was playing with frequencies. My first song I composed at age seven, because I wrote the whole thing down, was called I Love to Fly. Um, (laughs) That's kind of unusual. I teach composing, and most of my students do not compose anything of that sort and never with that title. So that told me a lot. Um, One other thing I noticed after the second adventure, because there wasn't that much time between the two experiences, so I don't have a lot of memory between the two experiences, but the accumulation of the experiences, I did notice after the second experience certain things, only because my mother would point them out. For example, I started seeing color around people. It was just there. I didn't think about it. It was just there. And as a child does, they just assume that everyone has that. So here I am in kindy. I'm back in kindergarten at the end of the year, which I thought was the best grade of all the grades, I have to say. Uh-huh. Anyway, um, so my mother one day, we used to have a lot of visiting priests or, or pastors come over to our home after church. And my mother one day said to me, well, why is it when so-and-so came to our house, you couldn't you just had to be by his side every moment he was here, and you had to sit on his lap, and you had to be touching him and hugging him. And and then when so and this other person came to our house, you hid out in your bedroom. Well, what was that about? And I said, well, Mom, they're coloring. And she said, what are you talking about? Well, I was just five years old. I just assumed everyone could see this. I said, well, the coloring around them. And she said, well, honey, I, I think you better keep that to yourself. I don't think other people experience that. So that kind of taught me at that point that all the things that I experienced, I should just keep quiet. As a young child, I used to have these horrifying premonitions about car accidents, for example. Now, I was never in a car accident as a child. Uh, It was at night. Uh, You know, you could say it was fear. Um, But as I got older, as I grew older, I tried to turn off a lot of that stuff that kind of came back with me from the other realm. Mm -hmm. Um, Although, uh, because it was very frightening when I was a young child. So at around the age of 30, I felt like I was getting stronger. I felt like I was ready to kind of pull it back in, that I was ready to use some of it. And... um, so then what I started experiencing were like dreams again of car accidents. And I remember one time uh, at about 3 in the morning, I woke up and I just had this horrifying dream of four motorcyclists on a particular highway close to where I lived at that time. And one of the motorcycles stopped and so it conked out in the middle of a freeway. People were killed. And it was very upsetting to me. And so I got up at 3 in the morning and started ranting and raving. That does not have to happen. That is not going to happen. It, you know, I'm just adamant that I'm passionate that this is not going to happen. The very next day, I'm on that freeway. I'm in the dream. I couldn't believe it. It was like that was the one time where it happened so fast. Usually there's more time, earth time, between the actual dream and the actual experience. So there I am on the freeway. I see the three motorcyclists. I pass them, just like in the dream. And I suddenly put on my flashers. I realize, oh, my God, something's going to happen if I don't put my flashers on. This is the dream. So I put my flashers on. Everyone slows down. Yes, the motorcyclist, his his motorcycle stops. All of them pull over to the side. Nobody's hurt. Because in the dream, that one motorcyclist was killed. He was run over by a car when his motorcycle stopped. Yes. So that was that was very rewarding. Now, it had, it had already started a little bit before that, where I could see accidents just before they happened. Once I started driving, I could see, I could almost hear people's spots in their cars. I know it sounds really weird, but... Like even now when I drive on the freeway, I'm listening to everyone's thoughts and watching all their movements because I can see an accident just before it's going to happen. And so numerous times I've been able to prevent accidents. 
Mm. I um, feeling there's a feeling that comes over me, and besides, listen, I'm always listening to other people, you know, watching and listening while I drive on the freeway, because I drive on the freeway quite often. <laughs> so uh, that's just part of life. So that's one of the byproducts. You'd be getting a lot of messages, I would think, with all the traffic around you. Can you sort it out, or is it just a general impression um, of um, of what's going on? I try not to listen to people's conversations. Um, all I'm concerned about is whether they're paying attention to the road. Yes. So um, that's, I really have developed the art of not listening to people. Like when I was dating different gentlemen, I have to say that I could hear a lot of things they said, and they would often say what I was thinking. I wouldn't tell them that that I was thinking that. So obviously my thoughts are a little transparent as well, or maybe everyone's are. Nobody just pays attention to them or they don't compare notes. So that part I don't know. But, um, yes, I've usually heard thoughts, whether they like me or don't like me, and, you know, that kind of normal stuff. <laughs> when When you were younger and... And you had some of these skills, I guess, already. Uh, did that contribute to the dysfunction of your family, that you knew what they were thinking rather than what they were saying? Uh, it didn't contribute to them. They, they had pretty chaotic thoughts, uh, a lot of contradictions, um, confusion about life. Um, you know, we children were not what they, my mom thought we were going to be. She, her mom died at 10, so she had this big dream about raising a family of her own because she had to raise her younger brother and sister. And, uh, of course, we didn't turn out quite the way she had imagined it would be. And so she, had, she was very conflicted in that way. Um, and you could detect that. Yeah, it didn't make it easier, but, yeah. No. Oh, yeah, that yeah. was pretty obvious. She was frustrated most of the time. The so you, thing- you were... Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, so that would that would make your life more difficult because not only were you trying to deal with the way she wanted to appear to you, but also the way she really was inside. Mm-hmm. But she was kind of one of those persons that wore her emotions on her sleeve, so it wasn't hard to tell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the thing that was really hard was that my family went to church, and they believed that they were good Christians, and I'm sure... From a lot of Christians' points of view, they were. However, from my point of view, as many as I see many Christians, um, and I did at a very young age, and still do to this day, I have a hard time with the hypocrisy. You know, if you say one thing, you need to to follow that action. And yes. what I kept seeing was that people were not their words; they were hypocrites all the time. They they had all these illusions about things, and well, I'm not saying just Christians. But, you know, I see that everywhere I go. Mm-hmm. Uh, belief systems are really security systems, so people don't basically go insane, to be honest. So there were a lot of things like that that were very visible uh, to me. Do you find this um, picking up these vibrations is it depressing to you? I mean, are you discouraged by the nature of humanity and the hypocrisy? Uh, it's it's sadness more than uh, depression. You know, I I know what's on the other side, at least what I experienced. And you know, after you have experiences of that sort, especially at such a young age, you're not afraid to die, and you try to you know give other people hope and and help them overcome fears and i i had worked diligently on overcoming all my fears i was a very shy child with huge amount of fears about earth because it was just so different than the other realm mm-hmm. um but having worked through all those fears all these years my final test was i was audited by the irs about i don't know 10 or 12 years ago and th- then i had to face my final fears after that you know life has been a breeze and it was a breeze even before then but i saw it clearly as a test <laughs> and i went <laughs> in with the attitude that it would all be beautiful and um you know, it would work out fine. It was no big deal. And I just took the appropriate, you know, got a, a proper uh, representative to go in with me. I, You know, I did all the right steps. And the funny thing was, after the audit, I liked the woman so much, I would have loved to have been a friend 
become friends. I mean, so it's all your attitude about life that creates your life. I know people don't necessarily want to take responsibility for that, but I find every time that I'm upset, like if, if like I went through a divorce after, well, at a certain point, you know, I went through different hard parts of life like everyone else does, and I yes. had very uh, hard thoughts, dark thoughts, sadness, deep sadness, and that attracted more and more disasters. And I've observed that many, many times. And so I've learned, um, like, for example, my, my husband is very ill right now, and he's been told he's terminally ill. So I've gone through my dark days, and every time I go through those, other unfortunate things happen. And it's always so consistent. So a word of advice, people, if you're feeling bad, just try to get over it and move on real fast because other things will start happening that are unfortunate. As a so, chaplain, as a chaplain, I often encounter people who have um, got misery compiled on misery. And I think, mm-hmm. I think it, what you're saying is exactly right, that we almost... Uh, uh, it's almost predictable that if we get to a certain spot that other things that are even worse or as bad will happen to us. Well, we keep let, attracting it, the same state. Yes. Judith, let me, let me get on, uh, to, to your third NDE because, um, it's kind of interesting that with all your, uh, intuition about car accidents that it was the result of a car accident. Well, let me continue with that dark, thought <laughs> that will okay. take us into the accident um my husband and myself of being together for 10 years decided it just wasn't working and uh, so i decide he he goes to hawaii every uh christmas to be with his family and that christmas i decided to move out um i had moved out about a month before i had uh taken i was at, going to school at the university of uh, oregon studying composing so I had just moved to a new place. I wanted to continue my studies. I was in my master's in composing. Um, I had a job because I studied with some famous people. I was a uh, I worked at building uh, organs here in Oregon, Oregon, uh, mm-hmm. USA. But they were organs based on 16th century organs, which is what I used to play in Europe: 16th, 18th, 19th century, very old type organ. So it was a modern builder. Anyway, so when we had decided, my husband and I had decided we were going to separate that morning, I was driving to school, and in order to not hit a dog, uh, I didn't hit the dog, but I was in a little car accident by hitting a mailbox and damaging the car. Mm -hmm. So that was the first thing. And then I think it was like two weeks later, or a week later, uh, I was working for the organ builder, and I was cutting a little slot for the mouthpiece where the air is blown into. The knife slipped and cut my finger. Now, I'm a, I'm a pianist or organist, so I cut my finger not knowing if I would ever play again. Um, mm. Went to, Immediately went to the hospital, got that patched up. The day it was taken off, I decided to go skiing with a friend. I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> I've had to learn the hard way. <laughs> so I'm still, you know, upset about separating from my husband and all that and all the things that went on. So the day we went skiing, it was a wonderful day. I was driving um, my car, which was a Mercedes at the time, and we were driving home, and we can't, We were going to come to a T. I was going to come to a T at a stop sign. The other lane, meaning the other section of the T, on the top part of the T, they did not have a stop sign. It's about 40 miles an hour on that road. So hundreds of feet, I don't even know how many hundreds of feet before we got to the stop sign, I slowed the car way down to about five miles an hour because I just had a funny feeling that I needed to do that. Well, sure enough, my body passed out before I got to the stop sign. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know if it's when we hit the black ice, but at some point now, when I woke up eventually, I thought back about this experience, and I had already been in a Gurdjieff or Spensky organization that had trained me to consciously die. 
So I've been planning on, you know, knowing that death was nothing to be afraid of. I have been planning all this time to dot my, when I died, I wanted to consciously go through the experience. And so oddly enough, my body passed out and a car, a man who was drunk, was going quite a bit faster than the speed limit, hit me being the driver head on. So my my uh, door was completely caved in. My seat belt broke, the steering column moved in a funny position. And later on I was the doctors told me that I sh- there should have been five ways that I was killed instantly. But as it happened, I wasn't killed instantly. Um I, of course, was out. I didn't even know about the accident. My body had already passed out, which was really weird. I don't pass out in difficult situations normally. So, mm-hmm. obviously, it was an odd situation. <laughs> so, my passenger, um, he was not hurt. So, the other fellow, the drunk guy, had a cell phone. So, he was able, because we were way out in nature, that he had a cell phone. So, he was able to call 911. It took about two hours for the ambulance. Meanwhile, the other... A uh, drunk driver and myself were both out, so he had to take care of everything. Um, he knew not to move us, etc. Eventually, we got we were taken out of the cars, put in the ambulances. We were taken to two separate hospitals. Um, I was out the whole time. Of course, they kept trying to revive me. I remember uh, for a, a second or two in the ambulance because I could tell I was in an ambulance. We were moving very fast, and the sirens was going. Uh, they kept saying, what's your brother's name? What's your father's name? Trying to wake me up, trying to keep the memory, because I had a pretty bad head concussion, and apparently that's pretty important to try to bring back some kind of memory. Um, and then I passed out again. And then uh, when I was in the hospital and they were cutting the clothes off, um, I again, they were trying to wake me up, and I, I wasn't interested. I passed out again. And then at some point during that hospital experience, I went into a coma, and I was in a coma later on. I was told I was in a coma for 23 hours. Um, so that's when I found myself in this wonderful place again. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and uh, I thought it was great fun. I had no plans on coming back. <laughs> and, um, you know, there there are places where you can... You can um, well, actually, all you have to do is ask, and you get any answer you want about anything, pretty much. Uh, I know some people have talked about, like, buildings they go into where there's all knowledge available, but I find you don't even have to do that. You just ask. Um, mm-hmm. You can do that here on Earth, too. You, you might have to be a little more patient here on Earth because you've got to wait. There's a time issue, time and space issue here on Earth, so you have to be silent long enough to receive the answers here. But anyway, there, you know, it's just instantaneous. Um, So, you know, I'm enjoying myself, having a great time. Um, It's the same thing, the the harmony, the oneness, the incredible music, the joy. You know, I mean, the one that, I don't know, there isn't enough you can say about it, but this time, the level of love and what it was, it was like everything was vibrating love. Everything was love. Even the nature and the animals, everything was like like a breathing in and out of love. That's the best way I can explain it, but it's way beyond what we call love. You just feel so complete and whole. Okay, so, eventually... A day came around, a time came around, whatever that was, uh, where I was approached by a, a number of beings and I was told, now you can stay here this time or you can go back. And uh, I said, well, I'm staying, of course. And they said, well, let us show you something. And so suddenly there were like all these screens, like hundreds of screens in space, that's all I can say, like television, you know, Mm-hmm. That's the best I can come up with about here. And they said, well, if you go back, then you will influence all these people's lives. And by looking at that, it was like, well, how could I not go back? I mean, I would be so selfish to not go back. Of course, I made the assumption that it was, um, you know, I would positively influence these people's lives. <laughs> so anyway... <laughs> I ended up back in my body, and when I woke up, my skiing partner was still in the hospital room waiting with me, um, and I just burst out laughing, and I said, oh, that was wonderful, that was so much fun, and 
oh, life is good. And, you know, I, I told him some of the things that I had experienced, how wonderful it was. Um, and um, so, but my body was pretty, it was very badly bruised everywhere inside, and it was very painful to even move. So I had to give up my schooling. I had to give up my job. I had to give up my new apartment. I had to give up my whole life. And I was studying composing at the time. And I find myself, you know, my mother couldn't take me in in California. My my younger brother couldn't take me in. My dad couldn't take me in. My older brother and his family, uh, who were living with her parents at that time, they were having a hard time in their life. But what my older brother said was, you come and live here with us and our children. We will build bunk beds in our room so that all of us will sleep in that room and you can have their little bedroom. Wow. And that's what he did. And I am eternally grateful, of course, because it took about four months to come back to life. But then when I did have enough strength to get back into life, then almost all my possessions were stolen. So my whole life was wiped away. And within a year, less than a year, it was within wow. six months. So, Judith, yes, uh, we are out of time. Okay, <laughs> this this has gone so fast, and and there were things I wanted to ask you. So perhaps we could uh, continue this on another show. Um, we'll look forward to that. Um, okay. But for now, I I just want to thank you, okay. Judith White, for telling us about your NDEs and what they've meant uh, to your life. <clears throat> and for our listeners, if you would like to listen to this show again or any other of our programs, please visit our website at nderadio.org. And for more information about IANS, please check that website at IANDS. Uh, thanks for listening. <laughs>